Welcome to Torrance First Baptist Church at Home. We are a community of believers whose mission is to love God, love people, and teach others to do the same. And we are so glad you're here to worship with us. Welcome. Great to have you here again this morning online as we continue, as we worship God together. Let's sing together a couple great hymns, starting with a Worship the King. It's number 104 in our songbooks. It says in Psalm 104, O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. Let's sing together a Worship the King. sing number 502 in our songbooks. In my heart there rings a melody. It does say in Colossians 3, sing with gratitude in your hearts to God. Let's sing together all three stanzas. In my heart there rings a melody. I have a song that Jesus gave me. Was sent from heaven above. Thank you. 
brings in your heart throughout this week. And now as we continue in worship, let's take our tithes and offerings. What's up, church? We're glad that you can join us. I just want to pray real quick that we can mean the lyrics that we sing and that God can be glorified in this time. We all said in Jesus' name, amen. amen. It was my turn. 
and all that you continue to do. I pray that you would open our minds and hearts during this time of worship and that we would get everything that we have to you, Lord. I thank you and I pray that you would be with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I've carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. I see you now. Laying it down And I know that I need you I run to the Father Fall into grace I'm done with the hiding No reason to wait My heart needs a surgeon My soul needs a friend So I run to the Father again and again and again Verses 1 through 17. Jesus heals a paralyzed man. 
When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house that he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, What is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, Why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, We've never seen anything like this before. Jesus calls Levi Matthew. Then Jesus went out to the lakeshore again and taught the crowds that were coming to him. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and followed him. Later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable, disreputable sinners. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. But when the teachers of religious law who were Pharisees saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I've come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who think they are sinners. Well, good morning, church. Welcome to Church Online once again this week. It is a great Sunday. It's Communion Sunday, which we will get to celebrate together after the, after the sermon. But I uh, just want to welcome you again. Um, we had a great time last week for those that were able to join us live and also for those that were able to join us at home. So many different options to gather together as one, united as the body of Christ. Uh, last week, if you remember, we talked about the authority of Christ and how his authority came from the Father and he had the authority to, to heal and cast out demons and, and, and to preach. And today we're going to look at another term. And the term for today is the word opposition. Um, and we need to ask ourselves again what, the, what opposition is. But before we do so, uh, I grew up as an avid sports fan, especially Los Angeles sports, uh, Dodgers, Lakers. Uh, and for me, the opposition was always clearly defined. The hated ones, the Giants, uh, the historical rivals, the Celtics. It was very clear. I wouldn't be caught dead wearing the, the black and the orange of, of the Giants or, or the Celtic green at all. It was always Dodger blue or Laker purple and gold. And it still is. Man, do I miss sports. I love, I love competition. And, and it's always fun to be able to root for someone, isn't it? But I find myself these days having to so often define terms, especially in the cultural milieu and political milieu of the day. Uh, terms that for most of my life perhaps were easily defined or maybe in ignorance seemed clear. Now that clarity has been a little bit obfuscated over time and, and in the haze, uh, it, it's harder to define. Last week was authority and this week is opposition. Words, of course, full of nuance and, and meaning. Opposition can be defined as resisting or uh, resistance or dissent expressed in action or argument. So one who might resist the position that you have um, and it's expressed in action or, or argument. Also, it could mean just a group of adversaries or competitors, especially a rival political party or even an athletic team, like we said before. Uh, obviously, these definitions are by no means exhaustive, and uh, it seems like our world, though, is, is full of opposition. Um, and, and you almost need to choose what side that you're going to be on, or you'll be in trouble. Personally, I'm, I'm taking my cue from one of my mentors in the faith, I don't like the idea of taking sides unless, of course, Jesus does, because that's the side I want to be on. I want to be on the side of Christ because that's the side of truth. 
He's always in opposition to evil in whatever form it takes. Therefore, I am in opposition to evil, the evil of the murder of an innocent man, and the evil of the responses of looting and rioting. I don't think Jesus would condone either. The Lord has a way, then, of opening our eyes through, this, through his word. Some may call it circumstance, but I know better. He's ordained every part of it, including our passage for today, which sees Jesus dealing with this opposition. Even as he heals and ministers, even as he tries to do what the Lord has called him to do, there are constantly people coming at him from all sides in opposition to his message and his actions. Uh, and, and also from his own people, no less the Pharisees, the Jewish elite. So let's see how Jesus deals with the opposition that he faced so that we can learn from the master and hopefully move forward in love. Let's pray. Father, it is is a, a touchy subject today. We spent this last week getting messages from, from all sides. And, and there's, there's a lot of difficulties that our society and our culture are going through. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of hurt and there's a lot of frustration and it's real and we don't want to deny the real pain and the real hurt and the real frustration. And so Lord, we we look to you because we don't have the answers. Only you do. Jesus, you dealt with those who opposed your message and you did it in ways that spoke truth in love. Help us to learn from you today. Open our eyes to your word today, we pray. Jesus' name. Amen. So today we have two adventures from the rapid race of Christ, the lion as he continues to roar along his his way. Uh, Both very familiar accounts, the healing of the paralytic and the calling of Levi, one of the disciples, and the subsequent party that happens at his house. So let's open up the word today to Mark chapter 2, verse 1 through 12. We'll begin with that first story. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And then Jesus saw their faith. He said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? He is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they had thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up, take your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of God has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose immediately, picked up his bed, and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. And indeed, it's a story that we may have heard since childhood, but it's a story that has such an amazing, an amazing outcome. And you know the story. Jesus has returned to Capernaum, apparently where he's decided to call home. And so he's preaching the word of God from his house, much like you guys are hearing the word of God in your house today. Uh, Word spread, and now there is no more room in his home whatsoever. It is standing room only. People are gathered at the door. A good thing there was no fire marshal in those times. Sorry, I had to go there. Um, But four men come bringing a paralytic to him, having literally to go through the roof to get him near Jesus. Now, roofs in those days were normally made of branches and sticks combined with clay, much easier to get through our roofs today. Um, Although Luke does tell us that the roof had clay tiles, so perhaps not so easy. Whatever the case, I want you to picture the scene. Here's Jesus, and he's, he's preaching the gospel, preaching the good news, teaching about the kingdom of God. And all of a sudden, <clears throat> you see little particles falling from the sky. And, 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 and a hole opens up in the roof. And, 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 and a bed gets lowered down into the middle of the room with, with a paralyzed man on it. 
What are you thinking? How are you reacting to this scene? Well, Jesus doesn't even, doesn't even skip a beat. Uh, he, he, he notices the man and, and moves into action. Uh, a word about this man, uh, the paralytic. I don't want to read anything into the text, and we don't actually know much about him, except that he is a paralyzed man. We don't know why he was paralyzed, how he came to be so, if he was paralyzed from birth, or if it was through an accident or an illness that happened along the way. We don't know anything about that. Um, we know that he's unable to walk, and thus having to completely rely on the care of others. But even more than the man, I think we need to focus our attention on his friends today. A word about these friends. And again, I don't want to read anything into the text, and we don't know much about these, who these men were either. But what we see in verse 5 is that Jesus saw their faith, and he was moved to action. This is the first time that faith is mentioned as a catalyst for healing. In chapter 1, there are other reasons given for Christ to heal people. Uh, rebuke, compassion, pity. What is this saying, if anything, about the necessity of faith for healing? Um, this is, this is a, an issue which scholars have debated for, for millennia, um, and, it's, and it's a difficult issue. Obviously, it wasn't necessary in the prior times in Mark chapter 1, so why would it be necessary now? Well, perhaps it was necessary, but we just weren't told that it was because of their faith that they were healed. And another nuance in this is the question of the Lord not healing someone that, that we have faithfully been praying for. How many, how many of you heard that before? Well, you just don't have enough faith. If you had enough faith, that person would be healed or you would be healed. There are many who die of diseases, who aren't healed, who have been so faithful and do believe that God can heal. So what, what's the deal with that? What is the place of faith? Whenever there's a question like this, the guiding principle is to interpret Scripture with Scripture. Remember, the Bible is one clear, consistent document. Yes, broken into different books with different genres, as we've learned before, but the message is consistent. The biblical truth on healing, I think, is somewhere in the middle. First and foremost, and this is key in all things, we must insist upon the sovereignty of God. He decides the if, the when, and the how of healing. We pray that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as we saw in the earlier healings, we were not told that faith was present at all. Perhaps it was, perhaps it wasn't. But the healing doesn't depend upon our faith, because if so, then it's God depending upon us. And that's not just not the case, right? He's sovereign in all things. If he chooses to heal, he will heal. If he chooses to forgive, he will forgive. If he chooses to act, he will act based upon his character. But yet it does seem like faith is an important element in healing, as we've seen in this story and many others throughout the Gospels. And I, I want you to turn for a second to James chapter 5, verse 14 and 16. And, and, and that might give us another, uh, another view of how faith is important in this act. So James 5, verse 14 through 16 says, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who's sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Now again, if we look at this in isolation, we might think, oh, definitely if you have enough faith and you pray, God will heal. But again, that's the danger of looking at things in isolation. But what I think James is trying to make us remember here is that we ought to be men and women of faith. We ought to be seeking the Lord and we ought to believe and not doubt. Because he who, who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind, as we're told elsewhere. And so when we do come to him in prayer for healing, we do need to believe that he can heal. That's the point that's being made here, is that he actually does have the power to heal. But whether he chooses to or not, we have to leave that completely in his hands because of his sovereignty. Ultimately, the Bible teaches, 
teaches us that God is sovereign and does whatever he wills. But the Bible also teaches us that man has a responsibility to have faith in order to see God heal. And so as we continue on, we see that Jesus does something very unexpected here. The people were expecting him to heal the man physically. But what does he do? He forgives the man's sins. This was something that only God could do. And so the scribes, knowing the law, began to question him in their hearts, declaring it blasphemy, which is punishable by death. By the letter of the law, hey, they are, they're right. They are absolutely right. Any, for anyone to claim something that only God had the authority to do, that was blasphemous according to the law. Only God had the authority to forgive. But notice how Jesus responds to their opposition. What does he say? First of all, he perceives in his spirit what they are thinking. Now, wait a minute. Stop for a second. Was this some sort of natural perception, like when, when my wife knows exactly what I'm thinking <laughs> and vice versa? Um, or is it something more? I, I think perhaps it was something more. Maybe this was a supernatural perception of Christ, one of the divine prerogatives that Jesus held on to when he took on flesh. Or at the least, since the Holy, the Holy Spirit descended upon him at his baptism, a prompting from the third member of the Trinity. And so perceiving their thoughts, he asked them why they're questioning him, throwing them the first of many rhetorical questions as we will see throughout the book of Mark. He says, which is easier, to forgive or to heal? Well, on the surface, it's equally easy to say the two phrases. We can say just about anything. To say the words you are forgiven may actually even be easier because you can't quantify that. You can't measure that. Uh, there, there's something, it's, it's invisible. It's impossible to prove. And it, and it might be harder than to say, take up your bed and walk, because then if the person doesn't take up their bed and walk, then you've been disproven and you don't have the authority to heal. However, as we know, it's actually harder to say you're forgiven because again, only God can forgive sins. The prophets were known to heal at times, but none of them could ever forgive. That was something reserved for God and God alone. So, what does Jesus say? Well, <laughs> he knows their hearts, he knows the hardness they're in, and he wants to show them, beyond a shadow of a doubt, what kind of authority he has. And so he says, well, here you go. Both. Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Notice that theme of the authority of Christ once again this week. In fact, we could have actually dealt with this passage last week in last week's sermon, but that would have made it way too long. But what I want you to notice is that Jesus speaks with confidence. He knows what he says, and he knows that it will happen. He knows who he is, God in the flesh, with all the authority to both heal and forgive sins. Just as God created the world with a word, so Jesus restored movement to the immobile with his word. And the use of the title, the Son of Man, is Jesus' favorite way of referring to himself throughout Mark's gospel. It bears witness to both his human and divine nature. It uh, communicates his exalted authority as foretold in the prophecy of Daniel. I want you to turn with me to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 through 14, so we can just get a glimpse of, of this son of man as one day he will return and, and amongst us. So Daniel chapter 7 verse 13 and 14 says, I saw in the night visions and behold with the clouds of heaven there came one like the son of man and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. You see, that's the team that I want to be on. On command, in response to the authority of the Son of Man, the paralyzed man rises up, picks up his bed, and exits stage right already. The physical miracle proves the spiritual miracle. 
And what does it say then? It says that all were amazed and they gave glory. And we have to assume that even the scribes, that those who doubted were in some way amazed. And we asked that question last week. What does that amazement mean? Did this amazement turn into belief or was it just wonder at an oddity? That question will continue to go before us as people react to what Christ is teaching and what he is doing. At this point, they do glorify God, the most appropriate response. I, I love the old hymns of the, of the church. And one of my favorite hymns is, is by Fanny Crosby, to, to God be the glory. It goes, to God be the glory, great things he has done. So love to the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his, his life and atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. And so we give God the glory today for he has done great things in us and through us, all through the power of Christ. So let's continue to the next part of our story today. We continue to see opposition, but this time the opposition is to the ministry of the Savior. And this is found in Mark chapter 2, verse 13 through 17. So let's read on. It says, he went out again beside the sea and all the crowd was coming to him and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and he followed him. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Once again, Jesus goes to the Sea of Galilee and his focus is on teaching. At this point, the only disciples we have been introduced to are Peter and Andrew and James and John. And here we get the opportunity to meet Levi, most likely also known as, as Matthew, the author of the gospel by the same name. Uh, we can infer from the text that he was a tax collector, which was a loaded position. But uh, Tax collectors were the worst of the worst seen as traitors by the Jewish people. Not only did they work for the hated Roman Empire, but they would take some of the, the earnings off the top. They would charge exorbitant extra amounts, you know, taxing the tax, and they would keep that in their pockets. This guy, Levi, might have actually even taxed the other disciples of Jesus as they were called from the Sea of Galilee. They were fishers. Uh, they were fishermen. And so why then would Jesus call this guy Levi, who was an, an absolutely hated man in Jewish society? Why would he do this? Well, I think it's very intentional. I think he wanted to show that his followers were not limited to the elite, the pious, or anything other than one who had a willingness to follow him. And that's exactly what Levi does. He drops everything, much like the other disciples, and he follows him. Friends, that's what I want to do too. I want to follow Jesus in all things. I, I know, again, we live in a world where it's sometimes hard to see where Christ is at work. We see a lot of evil around us, and I, and I get it. Sometimes our vision can become blurred. But I think if we're clearly seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that all these other things will be added to us. I want to be that kind of a humble servant that follows him, warts, bald spots, imperfections, mistakes and all, admitting when I have failed, as indeed I know I have so many times, and yet he continues to forgive me. I just want to follow him. And I hope that's the desire of each of us today. And so then we're magically whisked away to Levi's house and there's a party going on. 
And the guest list for this party, Jesus, his disciples, a bunch of tax collectors, and a bunch of sinners. Oh, to be a fly on the wall at that party. Imagine the conversations in that room. Imagine the opportunity for Jesus to show love to people and to speak truth to them as well. This was a typical Jewish gathering as people were reclining at the table. Um, if you've ever been to like a Moroccan restaurant or a, kind of a Middle Eastern restaurant, uh, I've been to a few in my life, it, you actually sit on the floor or maybe on cushions or pillows and, and you kind of recline around a table. And that's what it would have been like. It would have been, been people just kind of reclining around on the outside and, and Jesus and his disciples maybe or the guest, the host of the house, maybe Matthew or Levi would be, would be sitting kind of at a center table. And so it would be just this great audience for people to, to hear what was going on to teach them. Um, another great place for him to teach, like I said. It's a setting that indicates acceptance um, because you, you're kind of in a vulnerable position. You go in and you, you, you sit on the floor. I remember eating at one of these restaurants going, man, this is, <laughs> this is not proper <laughs> for me. Um, but it was something where I just I really I felt comfortable kind of kick your shoes off, lean up against a couch, you know, eat your food, didn't matter if you spilled on yourself, but um, just it, it's a, it's a, it, it breeds familiarity and, and acceptance and friendliness. And just as they are enjoying, though, a good time together, of course, what happens? The opposition shows up once again. This time, it's the scribes of the Pharisees. So Jesus now is garnering more and more attention, and the muckety-mucks are starting to show up. If you know who the Pharisees were, they were people who were the, the, the religious kind of leadership. So not only the scribes, the experts of the law, but these were the leaders, and they're sending their scribes to find out what's going on with this Jesus. What are the things that he's saying? They probably remember his call to the paralytic man that his sins were forgiven. And so now they're trying to test him even more. Um, and of course... Do you think they actually speak to Jesus? No. <laughs> they should have if they had something against him, but he, of course, overhears them anyway. So what are they questioning? What are they questioning at this time? Well, they're questioning who he's hanging out with, his association with the tax collectors and the sinners. According to the Pharisees, these groups disregarded the law of Moses, and Jesus needed to stay away from them to keep himself clean. You see, what they didn't realize is that mere association with them does not make him unclean. It would be joining in their acts of sin or condoning their acts of sin that would make him unclean. Jesus maintains personal purity and is able to extend mercy. You see, the Pharisees wanted to maintain this personal purity so much that they had no witness, they had no outreach, they had no place to be able to talk to those who were in desperate need of salvation, the kingdom of God. You see, that must be true of all of us as followers of Christ. As Jesus prayed for his disciples on the night before his crucifixion in John chapter 17, verse 13 through 18, if you want to turn there, and I want you to notice what he says of them in terms of their involvement in the world. Here's what he says, verse 13 through 18, chapter 17 of John. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I'm not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And what I see there is, is two sides, maybe even of the same coin. We must not be of the world. We must absolutely not be. He calls us to be holy as he is holy. He calls us to put on Christ, to keep ourselves from being defiled by the world, to resist the enemy, to flee temptation, to even call out sin as warranted. But we're also called to be in the world, going to all the nations, preaching the good news, sharing the love and compassion of Christ. It's not an easy balance, as one may gravitate toward either extreme. 
becoming a holy huddle where we have absolutely no connection with the world around us, or looking so much like the world that we no longer have a witness at all. So we have to find that balance, being in the world and not of the world. So how would Jesus respond to the opposition this time? Well, his response was simple and was straightforward. Just like a physician's job is to heal the sick, he came to call the sinners, not the righteous. And ironically, however, it was the opposition who were just as sick as the sinners and tax collectors. They were just oblivious to the fact of their self-righteousness and their hypocrisy. At least the sinners knew they were sick and they sought the Savior. I wonder what side Jesus would put us on today. Would we be lumped up with the Pharisees, the scribes, the teachers of the law, standing in the way of the gospel, forcing people to jump through hoops just to hear the message, even denying them access to the Savior? Or will we be on the side of the sinners? Not, not condoning sin, not not compromising our beliefs, but would we welcome them in? Would we say, this message is for you? Do we see ourselves as one of them? Yet, for the grace of God, there go I. Would we be like the, the Pharisee who said, oh, look at, look at this offering that I gave. I'm, I'm so good and pious. I'm not like that other man over there. Or would we be like that tax collector who beat his chest? And said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy. Do we point fingers? Or do we submit humbly to the King of Kings? Again, we're living in such times of hostility, friends. And, and this is a... It's something that's really been weighing on me. It's so easy to judge the other for doing wrong. It's so easy to justify our actions. It's so easy to take sides. I want us to be on Jesus' side. Standing up for those who can't stand up for themselves. Being above reproach. Not having to justify anything because I am walking step by step with Jesus. I don't want to be found in opposition to him. One lesson for us today. Just one. I know how anti-Baptist of me. Truth in love. Warren Wearsby once said, truth without love is brutality. And love without truth is hypocrisy. If we hammer people with the truth and don't show care for them, we're just being brutal. But if we don't speak the truth and all we do is accept sin and condone sin, we might as well be just like them. And that's hypocrisy. Why truth in love? Because that's what Jesus did. He spoke the truth in love. He called out sin in all of its forms. He spoke out against injustice in all of its forms. And he did so because he loves us. And he loved us, friends, to the point of laying down his life. Can we come together today under the unifying bond of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who so loved each of us that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Let's pray. Oh Lord, again, my heart is just so burdened, so, so burdened for what's going on in, in our world today. It, it, it is, it, it, words can't even describe it. But I know that you are good and your mercies endure forever. 
And the same sort of opposition that goes on today is opposition that you faced as well. Lord, may we look to you. Keep our eyes fixed on you. Seek your kingdom first. Learn to love like you love. Learn to speak truth like you did. And in all things, speaking the truth in love, that we would reach out, share the gospel, further the reach of your kingdom. We pray this believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you please join us now for our time of communion together? The greatest act of love that Christ showed us was when he died on a cross for our sins. And today we come to our time of communion to celebrate that, to remember that, to reflect on the goodness and the grace and the love that he showed us in that act. And as he took that bread in that upper room with his disciples, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Again, the greatest act of love is to lay yourself down for your friends, as he told us in John 15. So as we take this bread, may we remember and reflect on his act of love for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you sent your son to live, to die, to rise again, so that we might have life in you. Jesus, the bread of life, we look to you to sustain us, to guide us, to lead us, as we remember and reflect upon what you've done for us. We're so grateful. Uh, We have nothing without it, absolutely nothing. So Lord, bless this bread as we take it. May it remind us again of your brokenness for us so that we might be made whole. We pray this believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take and eat. We also know on that same night that the Lord Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples. And he shared with them something very special. He told them that this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Take ye and drink it in remembrance of me. How thankful we are for this cup that signifies his shed blood, whereby all of our sins would be forgiven now and forever. Praise his name. And so let's take this cup, shall we? This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Take and drink all of it in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this wonderful cup that signifies your sacrifice for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now it's our privilege to sing once again, so we invite you to please join with us as we sing praises to our wonderful Lord. And now let's turn over to number 526, another wonderful hymn, The Solid Rock. No one can lay any foundation other than Jesus Christ. We'll sing together all four stanzas of this great hymn, The Solid Rock. Oh, Father, round is 
great singing this morning. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed our time together. Please feel free to check out any of our other sermons posted on our YouTube channel. And if you have any prayer requests, you can contact us at 310-328-5030. Also, please let us know if you've recently committed your life to Christ or would like to join our church family and we can put you in contact with one of our pastors. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and share it. Have a blessed week.